And I think we're live. Do I see and hear you guys? Are you there in the chat? Hello? Hello? Good morning? I think it's on. Hey, there we go. All right. It's good to see you guys. It's good to hear from you guys. Let me start with what we're supposed to be doing here. All right. Welcome to Red Morning. There we go. We are going full synth with you guys today. Hope you enjoy it. It's going to be a fun one. Uh, if you're expecting... If you're expecting some kind of defense of Scientology, I hate to, I hate to let you know. Probably not going to happen. <laughs> probably not going to happen. Not because I particularly care. I don't find it. I don't find it to be a topic I'm that interested in. I think the furthest I've looked into it is watching Tom Cruise act a damn fool, and watch uh, anonymous guys from 4chan start uh, talking smack about them. In that brief rabbit hole of like the 2000s. Anyways, it's a controversial title though, isn't it? Jeez, the click-through rate on that must be insane. What the hell is he talking about? Well, I don't know much about the science thing, but I do know they don't like psychology and they don't like pills and they don't believe it works. And while I hate, it's like, uh, what's that meme of uh, the person you hate more than anything just made a good point? <laughs> but we'll, we'll insert that meme here. So to bring this to a red pill topic. Although, by the way, uh, Carl wishes the best, but he couldn't be here today. So we're doing this one as a solo. His life got super busy, you know, and super spy stuff. Now that James Bond is there, everybody's trying to recruit for the KGB or whatever he's working for now, FSB. Um, If you guys don't know, rule zero. Like, what is that? Well, that was a rule that we came up with within the Red Pill um, community. I can't really call it that because it's more like 18 different communities. Hey, what's going on, guys? <laughs> a lot of hellos here, so it's good. Like I said, hello to everybody back. Hey to all the T-Rexes. T-Rex army. <laughs> Anyways, rule zero was a way to kind of have an overarching moderation. And every subreddit, doesn't matter if they got along, if they didn't get along, kind of agreed it was a good idea. So what rule zero means is that if you're here, you're here to improve male sexual strategy and outcomes. That's the first part of rule zero. The second part of rule zero is to create a positive identity for men. Now, I, I agree a, identity was kind of like a bad choice of words there, but I mean, whatever, it is what it is. Well, it's only controversial because nobody likes Scientology. Neither do I, but whatever. Got to get the guys clicking. If you don't click, you don't watch. And if you don't watch, you don't learn. And if you don't learn, you don't smash. And if you don't smash, then you become a MGTOW 42069. And nobody, nobody wants to be MGTOW 42069. <laughs> Except for whoever landed that account. As soon as I brought that up on the show, somebody's like, yeah, I'm going to lock down this Twitter account. <laughs> um, what the hell do you mean by positive male identity? And this is something that... Uh, I am finding a lot of people on social media and just guys in general are trying to play catch up with. Absolutely hilarious. The problem is they absolutely suck at it. And I will say this, the the inspiration, the inspiration came from a little tweet exchange with Dr. Sean Smith, who I would consider, I don't want to say friend, I, like friendly acquaintance. I got no problems with the guy. I like the guy. Can't tell if he likes me. It's hard to tell if I'm talking to the guy or the brand lady. But a couple ground rules before we get started here. All right. So I see you guys in the chat. I'll do my best to keep up with you guys. If you need to grab my attention, throw out a super chat. If you have a question regarding sexual strategy, whatever the topic, feel free to throw it in there. Um, I'll make sure to shout it out. We got the chat set up here so you guys can see it all nice in there. And... Let me know what you think of the new of the new visuals, because I'm not lying. I am a huge fan of the synth stuff, and it's really starting to make me enjoy live streaming. Okay. Having said that, we get started. So what's a positive male identity? Well, there's um, certain things 
a sidebar. Sidebar was a concept on Reddit where you could have like a permanent artifact of, of aggregate material. So that way when people first get to a place, they can learn about things. Blogs have it too with their like archive or there's always like a go-to menu list. Like first year Rolo, first year Roycey. So the sidebar was as close as you get to some kind of like canon. And I like it too because it's not some guy telling you, here's my shit. Here's why you need to sign up. My news, like the standard brand thing. Sign up for my newsletter, watch my YouTube channel, buy my merch. Which by the way, do all those things. Do all those things. It was more, okay, well we found that most guys coming here start in the anger phase. So for the anger phase, you gotta learn... And uh, I think the Red Pill put up a bunch of great stuff. And it's in my sidebar series on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Like I said, we're, we're in the future here. The future of tomorrow today, Gerard. Um, so they start with Esther Villar's The Manipulated Man. Which I would say, if you're in the anger phase, it's a way of validating that anger. Because that's a huge problem for men when they first start out. Is that they're angry. They don't know why. And everybody is just telling them, stop being angry. Because everybody's all worried about an incel shooter and, like, stop rocking the boat, man. So the purpose of that is, like, hey, like, you're angry. I get why you're angry. Here's the things that have been happening that cause anger. And if you guys don't know, from a psychological perspective, anger is considered a social emotion. The hell does that mean? Well, a social emotion requires two parts. And this is how it differs from a normal emotion. It requires a grievance... And it requires intent. It's very strange. Case in point, if you stub your toe, you're going to get hurt. If somebody hits your toe or steps on your foot because they wanted to, you get angry. Angry is social in that it actually signals to the other person. As a guy, like, you know how you know how the, the Rolo Tomasi quote is, uh, the only agency a woman has is her sexuality? I'm sure you've heard the thing. Well, the closest we have to a corollary here is that the only agency a man has is his is violence, his physicality. Completely reductive, because that's not entirely true, but from like a caveman, paleolithic, uh, evolutionary psychology perspective, that's how our brains are wired. As a guy, as a girl, your, your tools are manipulation. And sex is your greatest manipulation because guys are thirsty and girls are not. From a male perspective, your biggest manipulation is your physicality. So you can see already, well, that's weird, because women are allowed to manipulate with impunity. It's not against the law on that, but anger is. It's like, oh, welcome to civilized nature. We we prefer the female condition, what Rolla would call the feminine imperative. To be fair, I don't think we'd have made it as far as we did if we didn't do that, so I don't begrudge it. But doesn't change DNA. You still get angry. You still have a grievance, and you don't know what the grievance is. So you lash out on all kinds of stupid things, and that's why you're going to go on to uh, YouTube right now and watch 500 MGTOW 420 channels with, like, bad women of TikTok. It turns out I wasn't the first guy to think, hey, if I put some goofy woman on TikTok onto a Red Pill Coffee video and explain what's going on, I can get tons of views. They all figured it out, too, except for they're really lazy. They just, like, here's women acting bad. Screw that bitch, right? So you're angry, you kind of find out why, you get through a Stervalar, and then, okay, you're angry, there's a reason for it, it's a phase, you gotta get past it, because you're not just gonna sit here wallowing in your self-pity. So what's next? Well, uh, and this is where kind of like there's some divergence between Married Red Pill and The Red Pill. The Married Red Pill is like, alright, what are you gonna do about it? Let's just get to work, we don't got no time to wallow in our self-pity. The Red Pill is more like, alright, let's teach you about some things first, so that way you can, you can go on your path on your own, it's not our job to teach you. So from Married Red Pill side, you're just going to get Dr. Robert Glover, Dr. Manuel Smith, and you learn about the validation-seeking behavior, which they call nice guy stuff, and then you learn assertiveness, which is Manuel Smith. On the Red Pill side, you're going to get Rollo Tomasi and your 10,000 10, foot overview of male and female sexual dynamics, and, and it carries on from there. We could talk about that at length, but that's not the point of this. Speaking of which, I have got to make... introduction got to make some notes because if you guys are watching this after it went live i want to make sure you can skip ahead to chapters as you see fit 
And maybe in the future we do a clips thing and we just start clipping these things properly. I like you guys that much. Anyways. So the psychology part, I think that ties into... And both sides really agree on this one too. In fact, almost all guys agree on it. Being attractive and being less unattractive are kind of the, the two broad categories of things you want to do here. Everybody's on board with be attractive. That's the self-improvement. Anytime you hear self-improvement, that's the be attractive side. And I would say that's like 25% of what you need to do on your male action plan, your red pill journey, whatever terminology you want to use. That's easy. Work out, be thin, dress nice, look good, smell great, have good hygiene. Learn to talk to people, be socially charming. Awesome, wonderful, soup hoib. But where we went into the problem and the topic of this show today is how do you be less unattractive? And this is where psychology comes into play. What are we on for time here? Be less unattractive. Being less unattractive is a huge amount of things. You essentially have, and this is kind of where like uh, things have failed men over the past couple generations. Like it doesn't really matter how long. It's just as a snapshot right now, we can agree it's that case. There used to be institutions that would help men. You see like the church, you see, you know, politics, maybe government. You can see like, the family unit, psychology, maybe. It's arguable, but that's the part we're going to focus on now. Anyways, all these things, they were designed for when men and women were stepping on a line, acting deviant. Here, we'll get you back on the straight and narrow. We got you good. We can argue whether that it was like a self-interested thing, like happy people or working people. Or we can argue that it truly is altruistic. God wants everybody to help each other doesn't matter. The point is, it offered some amount of stability. Was it perfect? No. But at the same time, at that point, we still thought leeches were the way to cure things. So, you know, it was perfect enough for the time. And this is the part that everybody has issues with, because like Jack Napier saying here, lose weight, focus on yourself, be charming, outcome independent. Everybody gets on board with that. The part of the red pill they don't like is the part where you essentially have to rebuild the institutions that have kind of failed you. You know, the church has failed you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what church you subscribe to. Even the Scientologists have failed men. So all of them have done that. You don't have to believe me. You got to see it every day. You go into social media. I remember this one guy. It was like two days ago. Huge. 100,000 likes and follows. So it was definitely a very resonant tweet where he's talking about he and a bunch of other African-American dudes went to a church and the pastor it's like, all right, who are all the single moms here? A bunch of girls raised their hands. Who are all the guys here who are good men? They raised their hands. It's like, all right, you need to man up and marry those girls. And the guys just walked out. So, like, the church doesn't care about you anymore. They care about filling seats. They care about filling pews. They care about getting their tithing. And it turns out women who need redemption are the biggest proponents of the church right now. And so they're accommodating them. They're accommodating women. And now they're disaccommodating men. Like, I've heard stories... Rolo's got a fourth book, by the way, on religion. I haven't gotten around to reading it yet, but I'm pretty sure I know a bunch of the stuff he's already gotten to because I've kind of seen where the research was coming from. But Ian Ironwood's talked about it before, too. And that was essentially the thing. Like, life, everybody's becoming more secular. It's been going on since at least, at least the 1800s. And as they're becoming more secular, the church has a problem with how do we get more people in the pews, and this is just the way it seems to work. It's marketing. Uh, you cats. Yes, Rule Zero is on today. It's going to be on Paul's channel. <laughs> and then, Gerard, you got a point here. So, look, don't take this as in, like, we used to be cavemen and now we're enlightened. I'm not suggesting anything is perfect. In fact, I would say the most charitable interpretation of what I'm talking about here with the, the praxeology that we've come up with in the Red Pill is that it's the absolute worst system that's the best we got right now. Like, nobody's come up with something better, not yet. I would love if that was the case, but we got what we got. You got a bunch of guys who are essentially hobbyists. <laughs> hobbyists using their own life as an experiment. You're going to get what you get, and the best we got is bro science. It's not my fault. The fact that this ends up going toe-to-toe -to -toe against gigantic institutions with trillions of dollars at their disposal just shows us how far we've fallen. 
Um, where was I going with this one? Oh yeah, the psychology angle. So you have to be your own coach. You could talk about workouts. You have to be your own coach when you're working out because everybody's just gonna put you on CrossFit. Everybody's gonna put you on some stupid workout programs. It turns out just something simple like a strong lift five by five, which, dude, I just got back to the gyms after COVID in Ontario. They opened the gyms after 15 months. So I'm like, I'm not gonna be proud. I'm gonna start with the bar and I'm gonna do bare bones, basic strong lifts five by five. So I've gotten up to the point where the last workout went all the way from zero to two plates and 10. Two plates on 10 aside. So what's that? It's like 235, 240. It's not the biggest lift ever, but you know, it started from 45 and it's incremental. It makes progress and that's good. Had I listened to people, they would have been telling me to do CrossFit. They'd have been telling me to do some random customized programs. And why is that? Well, because everybody wants to get paid and nobody can get paid by telling you to do the basics. Everybody gets paid by promising they have the solution, everybody else is wrong, and you should be scared because they're filling your head with soy. Having said that, is a is a pretty good thing for me. So I'm all like in the red zone right now because if you don't know, I've had my I've I've been to Snap City when I was like 24, time in the military. So whenever I get two and a half plates to three plates, that's where that's where I start to worry about injury. So. I'll probably be a lot slower in progression in this next little bit, but that's fine. Like I said, you don't want to get injured. We're getting older. But you have to be your own coach. Well, that's weird. You'd think all these coaches around here, all these high school coaches, like, you know, they don't even have recess anymore. People just stop teaching men how to be physically fit. Well, that sucks. In fact, it even went so far, and it's, it's absolutely wonderful. There is a Christopher Hitchens article for, I want to say Vanity Fair, about the history of the Boy Scouts. And here's how fun it is. The Boy Scouts, I mean, whatever you think about it, it originally was there to teach men to be to be functional, to be useful, to be fit, to be healthy, to build a brotherhood, all that shit, right? Apparently, it was invented the exact same time that the brown shirts in Germany were invented. And so the the only difference between the Boy Scouts and the brown sh and the the what do they call Hitler Youth was like what country they came from. And you start to find there's all kinds of like this stuff did work well but it had kind of a dark side to it. Psychology did too, and that's what we'll get here. So you have to be your own coach. Then you learn about diet. Well, now you gotta be your own nutritionist. Why is that? Because everybody's talking about shit that has nothing to do with food. Everybody's telling you, oh, soy is healthy. Then everybody else is telling you, no, canine is healthy. You gotta eat nothing but meat. And then everybody, keto is healthy. If you aren't eating seeds and grains like a caveman, GMO's not healthy. And then you find out, well, technically everything's a GMO. It's just a matter of how quickly we're doing it. So everybody's got all these wonderful ideas and nobody knows what's one's right. And everybody's just trying to sell you their shit. So, and the worst part about it is almost all of it is wrong. Because everybody just wants you to buy their food. If their food is better, so much the better. But it doesn't have to be. It just has to be marketed better. There's no liability to it. Who can? I mean, who can say the rice husks that they use to make Bud Light didn't cause mad cow disease in you because there's apparently human proteins in rice enough. If you guys haven't heard that story, that's just like a, all right, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, but supposedly some lab um, put a GMO crop of rice where they added human proteins into it. And it was for some kind of like medical purpose. I cannot remember why, but even though they followed the uh, risk and safety procedures so that we don't get cross contamination, it ended up infesting other fields of rice which is the stuff that Budweiser was using. So there's an argument to be made that Budweiser is made of people like Soylent Green, and there's nothing you can do about it. Is that dangerous? I don't know. But you got experts saying this shit that they don't absolutely know about. So you got to learn what you got to do. You got to learn what you got to learn. You got to be your own nutritionist. You got to be your own workout coach. Fine. Got to handle it. It's got to get handled. Nobody else has a self-interest in you, just in themselves. Welcome to the world. Wahoo. And... This is the point that we're getting to here. Here, we gotta get some slack on this thing. You have to be your own psychologist and you have to be your own psychiatrist because by and large, and even, even Dr. Smith agrees on this one, by and large, psychology and psychiatry, the mental health professions have failed, failed in their primary objective, which is to increase mental health. I mean, we can look at the broad things. Mental health has gotten worse. The, what is it? Um, Psychology was invented in like the 1800s, you know, Jungian stuff and Nietzsche, and it's advanced. 
So in that time, has people's mental health gotten better or worse? I mean, it's pretty objective here that it's gotten worse. Why has it gotten worse? Well, it's either gotten worse because what we've diagnosed as mentally unhealthy has increased, or people's state of mental health has decreased. Probably a combination of both. So it's very hard to make the case for psychology being good when their longitudinal trends are showing that things are getting worse. Maybe they are doing some good, maybe they're not, but not good enough to stave off whatever direction we're heading now towards mental illness. Of course, and this is kind of where the Scientologists have a point. This is why I only drink hard spirits. Well done, sir, well done. Um, yeah, so what happens? And it's weird because there was a great psychologist I consider, or psychiatrist, Psychologists are the drug ones, psychiatrists are the talk ones, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe flip that around. I always get them mixed up. Anyways, he was making the case that uh, certification is a form of fetish. So you go to school for eight years. That creates an eight-year investment. Do you need all eight years of school to become a qualified psychiatrist? Maybe, maybe not. But let me ask you this. And if there is a doctor, mental health doctor in the audience now, please let me know. If I'm off topic, let me know. But I'm pretty sure I'm not. There is no part of the certification to become a mental health practitioner where you have to describe the chemical effects of Xanax, SSRIs, or antipsychotics. Which is weird because 80% of the profession gives prescriptions for that on a daily basis. Thank you, researchers and the pill pushers. So... The most common thing done by the practice is to give people drugs. And there's not a single part of knowing about those drugs that's involved in becoming qualified to hand them out. Interesting, huh? I'd say almost general medicine's kind of working that way new, because I don't know who here has a GP or not. But how many... Here. To make my point in a more relatable way, how many of you guys have a GP? And of those guys, how many of your guys' general practitioners actually fix things versus how many of them just hand out referrals to other people or basically you know i need this pill and they'll say yes here you go put it in the chat i'm actually genuinely curious if you guys are watching this after the fact check out the chat right here you'll see yourself to be fair the military ones they weren't bad but most of the time they would just give you sudafed sudafed ibuprofen and tell you to go back to work or percocet Percocet, Sudafed, Ibuprofen. That's the one. Yeah, they just hand referrals. Isn't that funny, though? Eight years of medical school. And what do you do? Well, I can I can point you in the direction of somebody better. They've just basically made themselves gatekeepers. They don't actually practice medicine anymore. Other than basic stuff. But a nurse could do that. A nurse can do stitches. A nurse can check your proctate or pro, uh, prostate. Yeah, and if you can refer yourself, then it's like, what point is the doctor? So this is the case I'm making for psychologists here. Now, that's the one aspect of it. It's the one aspect of it. There's more to it. So they're giving you pills they don't know. How do they find out about these pills? Well, there's generally um, medical, I don't want to call them door-to-door -door salesmen, but they essentially are. They're traveling salesmen for the pharmaceutical agency. There's like a joke on Scrubs, if you remember that show from like the 2000s, where it's always like a hot chick that's in charge of like going to the doctors, bringing them free food, a couple gifts, talking about this great new drug, essentially giving them a PR statement. I mean, yes, there's research. Yes, there's a lot of research. Sometimes it's replicated, sometimes it's not. How many doctors do you know that take that read research on a regular basis? Probably not a lot. In fact, I would argue, you, I bet you a lot of doctors haven't touched a research paper since they were in like residence. Now, see, in Esteban here, he's right. What they do, they just test to see product elimination. That's true. That's the theory of it. But does that work out in practice? And is that working out today? I would argue less so than we'd like. Less so than is ideal. So you got that aspect of it, right? Which is kind of annoying. And everybody always says, and there's, you know, and what's the joke? The joke is always, ah, oh, the guy's too proud to go see the doctor. You're hurt, just go see him. I'd argue that guys mostly like, I'm tired of going to somebody to tell me they don't know and they can send me a specialist. Now I have to sit here for six months waiting for something and I don't even know. My vet is actually a great example of this. Well, he used to be my vet. 
our dogs would do something and get sick. Case in point, Hitchens, the big dog. One day, we look over, and one of his eyes is just blood red. We're like, what the hell? So we go take him to the doctor. We're like, doc, what is this? Oh, it's probably a detached retina. Uh, we have to get a bunch of tests. We need to do a blood test. We need to do this. They had like 18 tests they wanted to do. And my girl's panicking. She's like, oh my god, I don't want him to die or be blind. Let's do what we got to do. So we do all the tests. The tests come back fine. And they're like, yeah, nothing you can do about it. You just need to see a doctor or an optometrist for dogs. And I'm like, what? All right, so let's find one. COVID, turns out you can't find one in Canada anymore. So we did probably $1,000, $500 worth of testing, $1,000. When all said and done, a bunch of drugs, ibuprofens, whatever. Just told that you're going to have to learn to live with it. So a week later, it goes away. Turns out it wasn't a detached retina. Whatever it was, it was just temporary. And so we're like, oh, that's annoying. So like, what's the point of a vet if they can't diagnose and treat stuff? They're not made. They don't guarantee that. Well, that's fine if you don't guarantee it. But then I don't think you get to play both sides. Like you can't both guarantee yourself as the arbiter and the, the um, authority on medicine, but then don't also guarantee your work. Just agree, just agree to disagree. You're, you've done more research and this is the kayfabe thing, right? Anyways, I'm kind of rambling here, but that's the point. So you get to this situation where somebody who hasn't been trained in drugs is being told by companies who are selling drugs that they're great drugs. And then they're qualified with a huge ego investment, eight years, nine years, schooling you got to pay back a ton of student loans so and i want to say it was the twain quote but it could have been somebody else it's like it's hard to convince a man of something when his paycheck requires him not to yeah well santiago you're right it probably was an inflammation and if me and i could get into it more like a lot of the times when i ask doctors and they're like oh case of point the dogs eat avocado Turns out the avocado skin and the pit is poisonous, but the fat is just, it's a very fatty thing, so dogs have a hard time processing it, but they can eat it and it's fine. Dogs ate avocado, we take a minx, we hear it's poisonous. I'm like, Doc, is this poisonous like cigarettes are poisonous? Or is this poisonous like arsenic is poisonous? Can't even answer that simple question. So imagine just asking your doctor simple, like try this, start asking questions about your doctor. They may be able to answer, but chances are they'll just hand you a pamphlet with some material they printed off of uh, whatever the doctor version of WebND. Now, I'm not here to conspiracy theory about shit like that. That's not the point. The point of all of this is you're on your own. Nobody gives a shit about you. People either aren't qualified, which is fine. It doesn't mean they have to be. You're on your own. Doesn't mean you have to be. Maybe as a society, a species, whatever, we just don't have the requisite knowledge. So then my question to you is, why are we treating these people as authorities when we aren't capable of being authorities. And that's because people like safety. Well, to be more specific, people who like authority like to be safe. And God knows, do I have to, do I really have to bring up an example of how this played out this year? Probably not. At least I hope not. If anybody's confused and is living under a rock in New Zealand, let me know. You're on your own. So you have to be your own, you have to be your own coach. You have to be your own nutritionist. You have to be your own stylist. You have to be your own psychologist, psychiatrist. What does that mean? Well, it, I hate to say it, but if you want to be a man, you're going to have to learn to read research. You may not be the best at it, but... And it's funny because once you read research, you find research presentation and research creation aren't connected as much as you'd like. In fact, they're not connected much at all. You would be surprised because there's a financial incentive for the psychologists doing the research to get published. The more you're published, the more you earn, the more status you get in your community. Replicating studies doesn't get you paid. Making new studies gets you paid. And new studies only happen when you think you got some awesome solution. But then you start looking into it. And I've done my best to look into it. I'm probably not as good as some, but better than most, sure. You find out most studies aren't able to be replicated. There was actually a study on this where they took a lot of soft science stuff, of which like the medical health stuff is soft sciences, hard sciences being like physics, mathematics. And they found out, depending on the practice, between 40 and 80% of the research could not be replicated following the same example done from the research. Psychology, by the way, mental health stuff, teetered on the 80% side. So that means, and here's the thing. So you get an authority, 
who doesn't have time to read a lot of research, publishes a ton of research, maybe reads the abstract, maybe the results, doesn't even bother to look up the methodology so good. And you get people, it's a garbage in, garbage out situation. And every time, look, I will tell you this, I don't care if it's pro-red pill or anti-red pill. Next time you see somebody saying studies show, or this study says this, go look at the study. Go read the results in this order. Read the results, then read the abstract, then read the methodology, and then read the discussion. And you're going to find, more often than not, what people said the science says doesn't actually say that. You're going to find out the study is absolutely ridiculously done up. Like, I remember it was this one, it was floating around, it was about, um, uh, not the power posture, but some other bullshit like that. And then you look at the study, and it was literally a PhD student went to ask all of his friends around the dorm, and that was his sample size. Yeah, and so, and Ryan's here, they take multiple studies, trials, and aggregate the results. You're talking about meta studies there, or convergent uh, evidence. Each one on its own may not be good, and here's the problem. Most of the time, research is not even cited. Nobody uses the research to do their own research. Like something, I can't remember the number, but it's it's over half of research has no citations. In other words, nobody references any study when doing their studies. Everybody's just yelling into the void. It's basically Twitter, Twitter with fancy mathematics. Yeah. And that's not to say, that's just for the pure scientific method of this. Here's my study, I wrote it down. People don't like that. They like the idea of peer review. You could ask 20 people what peer review means. They won't even be able to tell you. But as soon as you say the words peer review, they're like, oh, that's an authority. I trust that. Peer review. People are smarter than me. It's like sometimes they're really not. And it's not even that they sold out. It's the whole system isn't really designed for what it's intended to be for. Which is, I mean, whatever. It's better than nothing, I guess, but not much. So you're at the same starting point. You got a bunch of people telling you things and you now have to learn to be your own psychologist for yourself in order to know if you should do it or not. Uh, Rumblefish, thank you for the $5 super chat. Healthy skepticism stops at buzzwords. We hear sources say, experts say, studies show, and we're done. You would think, and that's a smart guy like you, absolutely. Problem is, most people aren't smart like that. Most people hear that, and you got a great example. It's like, oh, what's the big deal? People believe what they want to believe. Well, right now you have to wear a mask before you go before you go eat at a restaurant and show off some paperwork because experts and studies and <laughs> sources say. So I don't want to hear it. So you got to be your own shrink. What does that mean? Well, first off, I'm here to tell you flat out, there is very few hard and fast rules within the red pill. And like there's... Men must be in control of the birth control. If you're not, if you leave it up to a girl for birth control, you deserve what you get. From a legal standpoint, like there is no argument f against it. Your only say on whether you get to be a father or not is whether you're using a condom or abstinence. That's it. As soon as you nut, it's over. That's one hard and fast rule. I would argue uh, rooting through the trash, rule seven, the Iron Tomassi's rule number seven is one of the other hard and fast rules. Your time is better spent sourcing a new girl than it is digging through the trash and building up a relationship with your ex. I would say the third one is there is no purpose for you to take SSRIs. None. None. Well, here, and JJ, like I, I enjoy the rabbit hole thing here, but here's the point. And this is what separates red pill from that alt-right conspiracy right-wing Facebook bullshit. How much do you need to know? You need to know enough to take action. That's it. That's as far into it as you need to look. Because you can spend all day making these unfalsifiable claims as to who benefits, who gets paid, what the incentives are, blah, 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 who's the lizard people. Not a lick of it helps you. Once you understand what is, then your focus should immediately turn to, what do I do about it? Yeah, I, I know you agree. We're doing this for the audience. We're doing some, we're doing some dancing around. Anyways. So what do you do about it? Well, in this case, you know, SSRIs are bad. Why do you, why are SSRIs bad? Well, it turns out there's a few reasons. One, serotonin inhibitors 
stop serotonin. The idea being they think it does that and then your depressive moods go away, but your super positive moods go away. It takes the, the highs and lows of your life and just flattens them. But on top of that, it has a couple other effects. One, it completely numbs you sexually. Your sexual desire drops off a cliff. Your sexual um, fingling drops off a cliff. I had a joke meme I put on Twitter where it was like, uh, you know those action figures where you hit the thing on the back and they swing an axe? So I give a guy an SSRI and then he's just sitting there and it's just constantly, yeah, you beat it like it owes you money. Keeps coming back for more. It basically turns you numb. Now, most guys who are depressed are usually depressed from a lack of uh, a lack of intimacy in their lives. For a social creature, you don't just want sex. You want intimacy with somebody. And killing your sex drive is the easiest way to destroy intimacy. From guys who already aren't getting any intimacy, but that doesn't make the problem better. Um, otherwise, it's environmental. Your job is brutal. It's constantly stressful. Concerns about money. But there's solutions to all this stuff. And by taking SSRIs, you're putting a band-aid on the problem. What they're doing is they're saying, I want you to feel better about this piece of shit life you have right now. And people can argue, blah, 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 there was a science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From a practical standpoint, you giving me SSRIs, you giving me antipsychotics, you giving me Xanax, basically tells me this is a coping strategy. It's a way to feel better. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should. Because what do girls want when they argue with you? Do they want you to solve their problem? Or do they want you to empathize? And they want you to feel, I feel it, man. I feel you. And then they can feel better about it. It's one of those things, man. The church has succumbed to the fem feminine imperative, as Rollo calls it. I would argue the medical profession also to the feminine imperative. Why? Because feelings are awesome from a marketing standpoint. It's not purposefully done. There was nobody in the room going, oh, if we just fix their feelings, then the girls will buy into all of it. It's like, no. It just turns out some people were marketing towards fixing solutions. Some people were marketing towards coping solutions. And the coping solutions win out financially. It's, uh, I want to call it Goth's Law. I could get the name wrong. But it's the point is that bad money always shuffles out the good. So you get these two solutions. Solve the problem, cope, and solve the feelings. Solve the feelings makes ten times the amount of money that solving the problem does. And so all you need is a couple financial situations where people have to pull the purse strings in, and the ones making more money will survive and thrive. And the ones that try to solve the problem don't survive and thrive. So they either get on board or they get kicked out of the industry. And that's how you end up here. It's not, and that's the thing, you don't need, you don't need Dr. Strangelove's war room to get there. It's just a natural progression of human evolution in an institution. I am overgeneralizing. Well, how specific would you like me to get Dong Zung? <laughs> would you like me to start naming names? Yes, it is generalizing. I wouldn't say overgeneralizing. I'm not trying to be specific here. Actually, in this... All right, we're a little bit early, but we're going to get to it. Don't listen to me like a Spurg. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this was... All right, so from the background, Dr. Sean Smith had a tweet where he said, AWALT, AWALT was bad. How about instead of vilifying all women with all women are like that, if you guys don't know, that's a mental model where you have to understand that men and women are different and that women's differences, all women are like that. It doesn't mean all women are like that. It means as a species, women tend towards certain behaviors. And as long as you're aware that all women could be like that, or they have an innate propensity to be like that, you can act accordingly. It's like treat all guns as loaded. And then he came up with some like little snarky thing like, well, all women could potentially be like that. And he made some weird acronym, but I guess that's not as catchy for marketing your, your ebooks. And I'm like, well, I mean, buy the tactical guide to women if you want. <laughs> I'd say that's better. Um, yeah. And so I go, come on, Doc, you know better than this. And he's like, why are you mad? And I'm going, well, this is getting nowhere fast. The you mad bro stuff. I know you did a very fancy way of saying it, but I got, it's basically like talking to my wife when she's in a mood. <laughs> All right. We're switching from coffee to uh, Southern iced tea now. So this is the quote to it. 
it actually is part of a two-part series, but the first part doesn't matter. The second part here, and don't listen to me like a Spurg. If you don't know, Spurg is a derogatory term. It refers to autistic, which is uh, from an internet language. It just means you're being overly literal about something and ignoring the actual process. And I think Whisper, he does it in a post here, puts it best. I'll probably, I'll, pull, I'll throw a link in here so you guys can actually see what I'm talking about. Here you go. If you can see it, it's been quarantined, so who knows? So nothing, nothing within the red pill is to be taken literally, except for the parts that are. Now, which ones? Well, that's up to you to figure out. Like, nobody's here to give you a comprehensive, literal, and precise theory of everything. I'm here to say wacky stuff that shakes you up and opens your eyes. What you read here should start a thought process, not end it. And right there, that line right there can explain about 90% of arguments, disagreements, or debate within the red pill. It's that people are taking things literally as a way to not take them seriously. And then from the red pill side, guys are taking it seriously, but not literally. And that's why you get like, a, all women are like that. Well, technically not all women are like that, so that's ridiculous. That's taking it literally. That's being autistic about it. Now you could argue whether the person is just unable to use any critical thought, or they're being um, purposefully, purposefully literal about it because they want to establish a marketing gimmick, which is like, you guys are bad, I'm good, you guys need to buy my shit. I'm not here to ascribe motive, I don't really care. I don't think people are spurgy about this though. I think they want to be. I think this is like emotional. Like I said, I've been, I was raised in a redneck town that just got ravaged by NAFTA, destroyed the softwood lumber industry, destroyed our sawmills and that, and then we ended up having a huge cocaine problem. And I would notice every weekend when we were partying, we used to call it the farm. It's a giant farm that like three generations of people have been drinking at. And you would see like people talking very emotionally, usually when they're high on coke, which was kind of weird, but. And you could already tell like no conversation is happening. It's just people screaming at each other and then Somebody's going to get a bottle upside the head. And there always was. Somebody always got a bottle upside the head. Hell, I remember at my grad party, I was sitting there. And I guess some guy got mad because Buddy took his girl out into the bushes and screwed her. So he grabbed a chainsaw bar out of his truck. Oh yeah, we had that one. Guys cut their own firewood at the party. Grabbed a chainsaw bar, cracked Buddy upside the head for it. Buddy got mad, beat the shit out of him. And then we had to drive this guy to the hospital. And they're like, you should put him in your truck. I'm like, no, he's bleeding everywhere. I'm not putting him in my truck. You guys can drive him down there. Took his shirt off, raping his head. And I was like, Jesus, I got to get out of this town. Is that one more please in the chat? Oh, look at him. But Ryan, if you're not leading me by the dick, I actually have to think and do work. I know, right? It's annoying too. And so many of the things here result, and I think the way Carl would put it is he talks about it as, um, dentological versus consequentialist. Did I get that right? Who here's a philosophy major? Make sure I got the terms right here. I don't want to be screwing it up. The idea is, am I trying to speak as accurately as possible? Or am I speaking in a way that gets the results that I want? Yeah. And that's the point of this. because this, And this is the carry up to this. So in every conversation, there's two channels among which information flows context and the process context is the literal meaning of the words simple direct sharing of information you guys may have heard me in the past talk about this i refer to it as open communication literally sharing information at work generally open communication logistical stuff hey honey pick up the kids at work after six open communication uh where'd i leave off oh context communication Anyways, uh, Lost in the Wild, thank you for the 100 lightning bolts. Is that Harry Potter bucks? That's awesome. I'm really grateful for your suggestion of the book, The Wisdom of Psychopaths. It's a wonderful read, and I didn't know that I was really looking for a book. Yeah, dude. Again, it's wonderful. <laughs> Wando, again, two euros. Thank you very much. Who hurt Carl? Who hasn't hurt Carl at this point? Who hasn't? I'll give you a hint now. He may or may not be in the chat right now. It's up to you guys to figure out which, which his alternate username is. Well, yeah, Ryan, that's the thing. Employed MDs have less ownership for patient outcomes than if they're under a private MD. But that's the thing. Like, what? remember that responsibility without authority thing that we always use to describe why men shouldn't be a plow horse? 
It turns out it's not just guys that get it, everybody gets it. And most people have gone with the response that, well, if I don't have authority over this, then I'm just going to do whatever I want to with impunity. So you guys need to catch up. So process communication is the larger part of human language. And fun fact, Wine More Please has a great post about this one. I wish I could remember where it was. If he finds it and links it, I'd love to, I'd love for that. But process communication. Well, the red pill attempts to open your eyes to it by talking about it in the context channel. We cannot dispense with process communication even while doing so because people do not work that way. The hell does that mean? Well, everybody looks at red pill stuff. We do a field report. I mean, even the pickup stuff. You talk about opening and nagging and uh, how to run the mystery method. It sounds weird. It's like you guys are describing uh, human interaction, a com giant complexity of human interaction as if it's the Chitlin manual for fixing cars. It's not. But by explaining this stuff like an autist, overly literal, you're explaining the, the, the context, and the process. So that way people can kind of like start to understand how to get it. You know when you say like women like a man who just get it? Well, what you're doing is basically color by numbers showing a guy how to just get it. Jack Ten of Hearts actually had a great one with me where he was arguing our different styles. He said I was more... He said that he learned to be socially savvy by like rote memorization. He considered himself autistic, but just he he played it by the numbers until he learned what he was doing. He said, for me, it was more intuitive. Whether it's true or not doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, process communication. And we all think that way. If you don't believe me, think of every fight you've ever had with your girl. Hey, what's wrong with you? Nothing. Well, you already know nothing's wrong. Because she said nothing, right? Or... Because she very quickly said nothing, avoids eye contact, acts all snippy, you know something is wrong, but she just doesn't want to come out and say it, for whatever reason. So, I don't care how spurgy you are, you understand process communication. And this is... Uh, I don't... Like I said, I'm going to assume... And Rollo and I talk about this all the time, where we always have an assumption that he's like, do people really believe this stuff, or is it just a grift? I used to be 100% certain. Dude, it's a grift. People are smart. They're acting Machiavellian. This is ridiculous. And Rolo's like, yeah, I don't think so. I think people here actually believe this overly literal interpretation. I really do think people are lacking the necessary social skills and understanding of process communication to get these thoughts across. So by, by a Rolo lens, the little beef with Dr. Smith, whatever you want to call it, the little conversation was him being overly literal because he doesn't understand the idea of process communication. And then my side of things, it would be, no, he knows absolutely what he's doing. He just wants to sell more tactical guides to women. Again, that's a motive thing. Who knows? Who cares? Doesn't really matter. But it's interesting. It's something for you guys to think about. When somebody starts talking to you about this stuff or any stuff, your dating, your relationships, your car, whatever, and they start becoming overly literal and ignoring the process of the communication, are they just incapable of subtext or are they purposely avoiding it? And the difference between those two is the difference of whether you get angry, they're doing it on purpose. Because remember, anger is a social emotion. It requires a grievance and it requires intent. So if you believe that, then you obviously think this guy's fucking with me. And that's why, you know, I think Smith accused me of being angry. Oh, I irritated a lot of people today. I'm like, I'm not irritated. I'm confused. So that's the one thing I should give Rolo really good credit for. By assuming the other person just truly believes it, by assuming they just are a Spurg, you actually end up with a more humane response. You're assuming good intent. They just don't know. But of course, then you run into the other problem. By assuming malice, yeah, you have to the, the run the risk of getting angry. The alternative to that is just not caring, which I would argue that's the best way to do it. But assuming good intentions, but just bad capabilities, then you offer, then you get into that stupid mental model where you think, well, if I just give the guy the right amount of information, then he will understand. And that's all kinds of horrible has come from that. So which one is better? I would argue neither of them are better. And this is where Wine More Please absolutely nails, nails it. Um, triage. Fuck them. Let them burn. Of course, then you run into the problem that you become insular and you don't, and that's like a law of power. Don't hide in your castle. Don't hide in your thing. What's the, I don't remember the exact rule, but that's essentially it. Isolation is dangerous. So you, so you got these three options. Fuck them, let them burn. Assume malice. 
Get angry. Yeah, fuck them, let them burn, get isolated, and lose touch. Become a cult. Fuck them, let them burn. Cult. Anger. Molestious intent. Get angry. Or, assume good intent and lack of capability, and then you end up explaining. Deering. Yeah, not everybody is capable of understanding. It's up to you guys which path you want to go through on these things. I would say, you know, I like uh, the game theory. Always start with the nice card. And then when you get the not nice card, play the not nice card. Yeah, not everybody is capable of understanding. Absolutely. But that's the thing. Like, why? And then you gotta you gotta search into your motives here. Like, why? Why do I want this guy to understand? What's my incentive here? Like, what's my motive? What's what? What's the purpose of this? And this is where you kind of get into the psychological side, where you become your own shrink. So let's say in that conversation. Now I'll tell you right now that the conversation between me and Doctor Smith there, my motives right there was engagement. I want people to engage the tweet, engage the tweet, and show that I am a civil normal charming individual and the trick to doing that is just act that way just be that way don't be a clown because clowns aren't funny <laughs> my daughter at six is much better understanding some things than when she was four yep <laughs> now if we can just get everybody else to the level of a six-year-old girl i think we have it i think we could fix we could fix all of this but again see the lifeline in the water still have to swim for it you're assuming that you're saving the guy you may not be There's nobody's to say any of this shit's any good it's worked for us so far. Could totally be like a correlation. There was actually a really good purple pill debate thing where a guy argued that. It's like, what if all of this red pill talk is just riding the coattails of success for a guy? Like as you get older, you get smarter. As you get smarter, you become more distinguished, more attractive. Let's say red pill doesn't do anything. And it just so happens that guys between the ages of 20 and 40 taking the red pill will still be an attractive 40 year old regardless. It's an interesting case. It may be true. Who knows? Could be. I don't agree with saying save, though. Again, I'm... I guess I'm becoming more disillusioned with the amount of, like, stuff that's going on nationally, internationally right now, where it's kind of like... I don't think being saved is in the cards. I really don't. I think it's just get yours, try to live a long life as best you can. If you have to step on some necks to do it, so be it. Yeah, lead less lights to the incels. That's one thing you'll notice that I do different than... Even the rule zero guys is that I just don't give a shit what black pilled incels have to talk about when it comes to women. Like why? I don't care. You haven't even had sex. Why does your opinion matter? What possible illumination could you give me to the experience? Why don't you guys just ask me what I think about the the, the chemical makeup of the Martian <laughs> atmosphere at that point? But that's the problem is because they're very angry, they're very loud, they're very outspoken. So it's very easy to be like, yeah, look at these guys. And this is why they're wrong. And that's an in-group. 100% best advice you can give, men. Yeah, stop taking fucking advice from guys that don't fuck. And that goes for the trads too. Jesus Christ. But again, you guys and I are in different positions. Like me, there's always that additional incentive. It's like, hey, if I, if I do dumb shit on here, you guys will pay attention to me. And attention is money. I think you guys all know my, my love-hate relationship with the Red Pill Coffees videos where I have like a girl on TikTok and I explain why it's like, ah, it is what it is and here's some shit and it's pretty funny and entertaining. I fucking hate them. But you guys, I'm almost tired of you guys telling me how much you like them. And I'm tired of all the views. I'm like, really? I could just put some girl here acting a damn fool, put a little bit of like goofy music in the background and say like, yeah, I mean, this is what they do. This is why you shouldn't have to put up with it. Here's your, here's what you do about it. 10,000 views. Meanwhile, I'll give a great field report about, uh, and Weinmore please remembers this guy, about the Alpha is Wolf guy that went Rambo, and we learned about the concept of guys that just, like, are overly literal within the red pill. And I'll get two. So I guess, whatever. You guys want your red meat. But, I mean, that's for me to solve. That's as a content creator. You shouldn't take this stuff seriously either. I wouldn't respect you much if you if that's all you watched. So where was I going with this one? What was the title so far? Don't listen like a Spurg. Yes, do not listen like a Spurg. So understanding subtext, context, situational awareness. I don't even want to use the word critical thinking because people have treated it like a fucking buzzword now. And it's lost all meaning. It's at the point actually where the jargon has lost all meaning too. Like AWALT? Nobody knows what it means anymore. 
they just argue about it. It's like, could you even describe it? The fact that I have to come in and give a description, me to some fucking nobody from Canada. But yeah, and that's, and then the point he makes later on, like, Spurgs can't generalize. They cannot grasp implications. They cannot grasp any nuance. They do not have a sense of proportion. They hear the content of a message and take it literally or reject it altogether. They do not grasp the intent behind the words, and that's not going to help you here. And that's true as much for the red pill as it is for the married red pill. Great example for this. Whenever a new guy would come in to the married red pill, he came in one of two ways. One, he would join in what's called the own your shit weekly thing. He would put his field reports in there. He would put in some work. He'd maybe get some responses. It happened every, I think it's Tuesday. The other way is somebody would go to the Ask Married Red Pill subreddit and put a big Batman origin story. And the Own Your Shit Weekly guys, everybody had patience for him. Okay, you're using too many she statements. You're describing this from your female perspective. Describe it from your own statement or from your own perspective. Or you're talking about everything you want to do in the future. Talk about what you just did in the past. And then what you and then what went wrong, what went right, and what you want to fix about it. You know, those kind of guidances. People have tons of patience for it. Guys can post in there for years, for months, doesn't really matter. Always patience. And they're helping each other out. Maybe it's to help the other guy because they know something. Maybe it's because they want to solidify their own ideas, and the best way to learn is to teach. The guys who went to ask Married Red Pill on it, for example, and this is the purpose of the place. It was never designed to be a useful place. It was designed to like keep all the retards out. They would go in there with their Batman origin story, and they would get what I would call tough love. <laughs> Basically shitting all over them. Breaking shit down, if you even engage at all. And everybody, and then you would get one or two responses. One guy would say, was ego would check it. He would take the context literally. These guys are being assholes to me. I'm going to reject this thing entirely. They'd make fun of you. They'd say you have a small dick, whatever. They get a ban. Then they come into mod mail, spurg out a little bit more, and then they get muted into there. That's literally how you would filter out ain't shit guys from guys with potential. And then other guys would be like, they would see past the tone and they would look at the message. Because I think, and Wine More Please has a great one on this one too. Again, I, oh, damn it. I should remember the title. I could probably just look it up by your username, but he talked about shitting on some guy for something, but you, you strip away the tone, you strip away the language, you strip away the him calling him a retard and that. There was actually something important there for him. But if the guy can't look past the ego, then he's never going to see it anyway. And so it's purposeful. When you actually sit here and you call somebody names and you get very mad, you follow it up with something useful. Military had it too. That's why you get yelled at in basic training. Did you know this? In basic training, all that uh, full metal jacket shit, it's there for a reason. It's because they're going to realize you're going to be in some stressful situations in your career. And in a stressful situation, you don't have time to go, hey, whoa, whoa, don't talk to me like that. No, it's we need you to separate tone from content. And in this case, somebody's yelling at you. Somebody's screaming at you. There's fucking bullets flying, you know, ships at attack, the missile buttons coming on. But you need to be able to keep your cool and then filter through all of the emotions, all of the bullshit. Thank you. There she is. And then come out of it with what do I need to do with this information? Ah, there it is. Yeah, men with no frame and the things they do. It's a great read, you guys. If you haven't read it, I strongly suggest it. Oh, there we go. I'm going to pin this one. I don't know how pinning messages work in live streams. So we'll find out. Yeah, so Spurks can't generalize. Uh, he ends it off. Oh, there it is. Nice. I like that. So to be masculine in a world that is forgotten, how it is just not to know something, but how it is to think differently, to act differently, to see things differently before, to adapt, is that you can't tell somebody. You have to show them. And they have to and you have to figure out how to be shown. And it's great because he uses the exact argument that uh, that Dr. Smith was having with Awalt. So if you argue about whether literally all women are like that, you're just being a spurg. If you treat everything as a shit test, when I've literally just written to you that everything is a shit test, then you're being a spurg. If you argue about red pill, whether it's full of Haiti stuff that distracts you from the message, you're being a spurg. Instead, use your burgeoning social skills to read between the lines. And if you do not learn to use and understand process communication, 
Not only will women never ever want to have sexy times with you, but you will also not able to use these instructions written here for changing that. So think about the presentation, think about the process channel, think about the subtext, use your own brain. Just because you're part of the red pill, he-man, woman haters club does not free you from the responsibility to think. Good morning. Uh, Paul's doing uh, rule zero. Yes, you did. So yeah, that, so that's where we want to get here. So when I get, when I, when I say science, what does Scientology have right about psychology? It's not a literal statement. Like a bunch of you guys came in here and whatever, you're learning now. Hold on a sec, we're gonna... New topic, what's the time? Where'd my thing go? There she is. One hour. We don't have a catchy title of it. I don't have a catchy title right now, but we'll come up with something. Hey, that's weird. All of a sudden this thing stopped. Oh, that's funny. When I did the pinned thing, it uh, moved your chat all over the place. Interesting. <laughs> Ryan, may I say sorry for your loss for Trudeau's re-election to express my grief? Yeah, it's... um. Canada is a very status quo place. I, a lot of people were kind of expecting it to be a waste of half a billion dollars, which it was. Thank you, I guess. Things will happen. We'll see. The new theory, though, is that uh, in Ontario, our province, our, pre our premier was hoping that O'Toole would win so he could just scrap the whole passport thing. And now, uh, now that it, Trudeau's win and it's going full steam ahead... He wants the billion dollars being offered to develop a system, but he's making the system so dysfunctional that it essentially can't be enforced. I kind of want to buy that. So who'd, who'd have thunk? Yeah, on the bright side, at least Canada's in Australia. Yeah, that's fucked, man. Again, and that's the thing. Like, dude, if you don't think this is important, it's not just about getting laid. Take the idea of what we just talked about, about process communication and emotional language and subtext, and realize this went from... Chinese TikTokers showing videos of people passing out in the streets to scare people come all the way to Australians shooting rubber bullets at protesters in front of a World War II monument. And then being thought of as the good guys. And then going door to door to ask people if they plan on going so they don't have to shoot them. Because they're worried about their safety. The guys in body armor with shotguns and beanbags are worried about their safety against a bunch of Aussies with like Forrester beer cans. Absolute crazy, isn't it? But, you know, fuck them. It's triage. Let's just say, if it gets bad enough, expatriation is always an issue. Or is always a thing. You just gotta do the math. Is the amount of success and value that I'm getting here, plus the social ties, your family, your friends, that shit, is that worth less than going somewhere else and thriving where you're treated better? And that's kind of... And this is off topic, but we'll get there. Just go to where you're treated best. Go to where you're treated best. Don't be emotional about it. Don't be a spur, because it's really not going to do anybody any good. Yeah, no escape. No escape. Oh, yeah. So things... No frame. So we're going to go back. I'm just going to call this title frame. Frame. Le from. So one more, please. I put it up on the pinned tweet here, which is really cool how that works, by the way. I love it. He literally explains why we do the things we do. And it's there's a deliberate action that comes with um, guys who truly get it, where you realize that things that they do are for an intended purpose. And it's amazing. Think about how much in the average person's life they don't act deliberately. What I mean is they act instinctively or they just wing it. Or they, they use their intuition or their feelings or their emotionality. Probably a lot. To the point that you're going to see him talking about a reason he does something. And it's going to come across as like sociopathic, Machiavellian or something like that. It's like, no, man. People, like imagine, imagine not acting with deliberate intent. Imagine not knowing what the result of your actions are going to be because you just never figured it out. You know, you don't have any experience. You don't think it through. That's... That's how your life kind of goes, which is ridiculous. I do like his explanation to Unframe because a lot of guys, they, oh. Frame is one of those things. It's hard to explain 
but it's very easy to understand once you know it. Because you hear guys talk about frame like it's a fucking life bar. Yeah, I had frame. My wife slowly whittled it down. And then I lost frame. It's like, dude, that's not frame. Frame is literally who you... It's like, it's not what you do. And this is why more pleases quote. Frame is not what you do. Frame is who you are. Frame is how you process the world around you. Frame in the same way that the way you frame a house is the way the ultimate house is going to look. Frame is how you frame your reality. Now, I don't want this to sound like the secret where like a fucking you believe it'll happen, but it's it's like a non-autistic version of that. Case in point, what are some of the old uh, quotes on that? Life is 10% what happens and 90% how you react to it. How do you contextualize things? What's the process behind it? And what I talked before about like the, the Smith thing, does he not know? Is he being malicious? Do I just say, fuck him? My frame defines how I react to that situation, right? How do you react to somebody calling you mad? Well, why would they call me mad? Well, you understand the process. They call you mad because they're mad and they want you to get mad to make them feel better. But I'm not mad, so I don't really care. There's a frame thing. They can yell and scream at you all fucking day. But if you decided I'm just not gonna get mad because I'm not invested in getting mad at this shit, then you're not gonna get mad. Like you can't whittle that down. The best they could do is punch you in the face, at which point you probably will get mad, but Again, frame doesn't mean you don't get mad. Frame isn't stoicism. You're going to get mad, but you're getting mad on purpose, and you know the results from it. And that's kind of one of those things, like case in point. You're talking to another guy, and he knows. Well, he should know. If he gets to a certain point, violence is going to happen. There's always, a, there's always a place you can cross. Now, a guy with frame knows that line. He knows what you have to do to turn this into violence. Brandish a piece hit you first, threaten your family, commit a crime, whatever. A guy without frame, as soon as you attack his ego, will lash out. That's why, and this is going to be a controversial one. How many how many World Star video World Star hip hop videos have you guys seen where somebody drops an N bomb and then gets knocked the fuck out? That's how no frame works. Now you're in jail. The guy's got a broken jaw. Nobody had frame in that situation. Yeah, nice tie-in. Having a backup plan and figuring out how to execute on your vision. Absolutely. Uh, oh yeah, so this guy at Weimar Please is talking about cannot get the concept that she can possibly view anything that happened in any other way than how he chose to view it. I'm going to go back to this one. And it's an old post on that. You can follow it on the rabbit hole. It's essentially solipsism, male solipsism. Do you remember where I talk all the time about how men are being raised as defective women? Don't take it literally, but understand the intent there. You read through these kind of field reports and you see it's basically a guy acting solipsistic, which we know to be a feminine trait. So why would a guy be doing that? Why does he lack the ability to understand that things exist outside of his mental point of view? Raised like chicks, man. Maybe all guys were like that, and you have to like actively train yourself out of it. I don't know. Twain argued that in uh, an essays of What is Man, where he talks about men being the equivalent of a train. And like, iron ore doesn't make itself pig iron. Pig iron doesn't make itself into steel. Steel doesn't make itself into an engine. An engine doesn't make itself into a train. All these things have to be acted upon to the outside. And so his argument is that men don't make themselves. Men are made by their environments. So if that's true, then yeah, men are being raised as defective women because women don't know how to raise men to be men. And now we've got a situation where guys are now fucking scrambling trying to figure it out. And that's where you get shit like, uh, fuck, I'm referencing Twitter a lot. It's so easy, though, because it's all the same shit every week. This guy is talking about, like, turn your men into boys. He's doing that rite of passage shit. And he took a picture of him with his man bun shirtless with a pair of jorts. And then he dressed all of his kids up in jorts shirtless. And he's taking a picture of them standing by a campfire holding axes. And I'm like, Jesus, what kind of consumer purchase masculinity are you buying into? A real man holds an axe. A real man has long, shaggy hair. I'm like, you've just taken the frontier man archetype and added a hippie aesthetic to it. What the fuck? I'm like, I've been out camping a bunch of times. Not once did I think, you know what I need? To be shirtless while I'm chopping wood with splintering in an axe. It just doesn't make any sense. 
Oh yeah, Dante, you got it. It's a good read, actually. It's kind of funny. It makes me laugh, too, because a lot of the shit we're talking about in the Red Pill, Twain was talking about 100 years ago, so there really is nothing new under the sun, man. Uh, back to the Why More Please one. He's like, how quickly can you tell when a man has no frame, no sense of his personal reality, because instead of being dismissive of anything that doesn't match the reality, he needs to try and peacock and dick measure. And this is my favorite part of this one. I'm going to read it word for word. I know you can read it yourselves, but I want it verbally on the record. He's talking to the guy. He's like, it's hard as hell to project positivity. And Wine Winemore's like, because you don't project it, you stupid bitch. You learn how to embrace positivity and enjoy life for what it is. Otherwise, it's all just horse shit. And all that you're doing is pretending to be a clown. Here's a hint. Clowns aren't actually happy. By the way, everybody here knows that you guys are going to fuck this up. It's on you not to be an autistic fuck and fuck it up, which you're obviously going to do anyway, so... What's the point of this warning in the first place? And then the ops response to that, instead of like, under, like this is the cleverness of that constructed statement. You don't project happiness. Happiness is a choice. You decide to be happy. You decide to be happy. You decide to frame things in a positive way. If they aren't positive, you make the steps to make it happy. You don't just pretend. You don't just project it. You don't just think happiness is like... Um or positivity because then you're just a clown and clowns aren't happy that's the that's the that's the process but the context is just he called me a stupid bitch he called me autistic and he said i was gonna fuck it up and then the op's like well maybe you're just talking about yourself it's cute how you say you autistics i think you're autistic and that's when you can tell a guy has no frame because he didn't actually understand the process and the, and the tone the open communication and the closed now if you want to look at this through a closed communication lens that's always funny too there's a few ways that I've seen that. There's, uh, I was talking about this on Patreon, by the way. If you guys haven't, come and subscribe to the Patreon. It's fun times. Uh, so the first way is called transactional analysis. It's actually a psychological thing. It's a pretty good study. Wait a minute, didn't you just say shrinks were bad? Yeah, but the study is still pretty good. And they're good frameworks. It's a nice kind of, it's almost philosophy. Parent, adult, child. They call it the parent, adult, child model. The idea being in every interaction, Somebody's going to fit into one of these broad archetypes. They could have a positive or a negative interaction as one, and that certain combinations are either sustainable or unsustainable. For example, a parent-child interaction is sustainable. An adult-adult interaction is sustainable. A child-adult interaction is not sustainable. A parent-parent interaction is not sustainable. So at some point, something has to shift here. Another one is the harmony and uh, status axis you put every interaction these are all closed communications this is i'm strictly talking about process here not context not the words the meaning is somebody talking to me like he's on my side or against me is he talking about me like he's higher status or lower status and then you put these you make a quadrant now in this case looking at this one i'll tell you in a minute but what do you think why more please is doing when he's calling the guy a stupid bitch is he considering himself higher status or lower status than the op is he considering himself on ops team or on, not on ops team or neutral? Something to think about, but that's the thing. You don't think about this. Or if you want to use the PAC model, is it coming across as a parent talking to a child or an adult talking to an adult? Now, the way I see it, my frame is that from a harmony status one, he's talking higher status and moderately on the same team which is condescension. That's generally the the, uh, the the context of how any conversation will go. He's being condescending to Op. Now, Op took that as condescension, but he doesn't understand what's the purpose of that conversation. What he sees is somebody's trying to establish himself as higher status than him, not knowing whether he's actually higher status or not. And then he's not on, he's not on Wine More Please's team. So he goes non, uh, uh, not on the same team, and lower status, which he kind of knows because one more please is a mod. So what do you get back? You get insolence. Funny enough, that's exactly the kind of interaction one more please is testing for because guys with no frame will follow the lead you give them. This is actually an example in leadership. So you take the top white, you act within the top right quadrant of that method. And then the natural response for people who just want to follow your lead will be under the bottom left. I'm better than you and I'm higher status than you. Or I'm higher status than you, we're on the same team. So if you want to fight back on that, we're not on the same team and I'm lower status than you. 
Now, if the guy was had potential, there's a bunch of other responses you can give. Sometimes it's completely oblivious to this power structure at all, and he acts condescending back. In which case, he's just mirroring, which doesn't really solve anything. Eventually, you're going to get to a, a different quadrant anyway, so we can just skip that for now. You're really going to get into a place where he realizes that Weimar Please is on his team and accepts that, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. He can have a higher status in this situation, where you generally have submission. I've done it myself. I remember my first field report. Weimar Please did that. I had put a field report, and it was stupid. He's like, why did you even write this? It's absolutely useless, and you admit yourself you know it. It's like, look, I'm not here hat in hand. Fucking it is what it is. Either I did something right, and you guys can learn from it, or you did something wrong, and it's a cautionary example. But writing it out was kind of important for me. It's like, fair enough. But then you see what you mean, though? From that process, you develop like a positive outcome because people understand the process. It's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Girls in our show. Nice. Um... The PAC model, it's a little bit different. I'm not the best with it right now. I'm still kind of learning a lot of the nuances about it. But my 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 lay interpretation is that Op is asking like a parent. Or I mean, Weinberg Please is asking, acting like a parent. A parent scolding a child. You stupid fuck kid. Stop being useless. And then the guy here is trying to answer as an adult. You can't talk to me that way. A very petulant adult. Not sustainable. And so then as the conversation goes through, he ends up getting into a more sustainable range, which is the insolent child. So you got the parent child. This is sustainable as long as these guys want to engage in it. But that's the problem is it also doesn't work. But that just shows how Op is incapable of navigating any type of social, uh, social dynamics. If he was better at it, he could have acted more like a responsive child. Again, the submissive thing that I was talking about before. He can act like an adult. It's like, I get it. I know the routine. You don't have to yell. It's like, just completely ignore the tone and just focus on the context. Okay, so you say it's embracing positivity. Can we talk about this some more? In which case, Weimar Please can make the choice that, and he's smart. So he's not just going to stay as like the insolent, as the parent chastising a child, because that is not sustainable with an adult conversation. He switches over to adult and then starts talking details. Okay, the happiness part is a choice, this thing here. And then they have like a normal conversation. But you see what I mean? Like these... These things are very good to engage. If you want to read more about this, by the way, there's a great book called I'm Okay, You're Okay. And it really lets you understand. So when we talk about like shit tests and comfort tests and uh, talking like a Spurg and all this stuff, they actually have a pretty good basis in uh, the human condition. Like this is stuff that's all come through. So you look up TA. Oh, and for the, the, the quadrant, you're going to want to find a book called Be Slightly Evil by Venka Teshrao, where he describes it in there as well. And I think, I can't remember what he uses as his reference of where uh, where he originally stole the idea from, but it's a it's a generally good psychological thing. That which gets measured gets improved. And so just take any interaction and then you make like a two axis grid on it. And that's how he decided to do it. You can make as many as you want. I find that one just super useful. <laughs> Jack, rule zero with Ryan, Curve, Chesty, and Weinmar, please. Dude, that would be fucking awesome. But you do realize, right? Like if I were to if I were to pay market price for all four of those guys, that's like five thousand dollars an hour. <laughs> you have no idea the fucking intellectual heavyweights. I am the fucking pleb in that quadrant. I'll tell you right the fuck now. We gotta see what we got here. A doctor, a lawyer, a PhD, and a fucking ex sailor. <laughs> I'll get into a bar. <laughs> Yeah, it would be nice. But we'll see. Don't hold your breath. Like I said, any amount of these guys' time we can steal, it's worth it. And it's guaranteed it's worth its weight in gold. I should be charging fucking for this. But whatever. You guys get it for free because what the hey. Part of me likes the whole take a penny, leave a penny attitude towards this. What does that mean? Hey, guys, help me get where I am today. The least I can do is pass on a little bit to you guys, right? Or, as the good doctor would call it, being a fucking cultist. <laughs> I shouldn't be mean to him. I don't I don't actually have a problem with the guy. I get it. he's just gotta do his he just Everybody has to has to has to pay the bills. So you gotta do your grift, right? Can't fault him for it. Okay. <laughs> oh, 
All right, so you want to talk about Elon Musk? Fuck, I got to learn about the Elon Musk thing. I just know the very basic bare bones, which is probably... All right, we'll do that. So 120. Elon Musk. Talk. All right, let's talk Elon Musk. You guys are going to have to hook me up with a lot of shit. So I just know the gist of it. His wife, Grimy, and him got divorced after three years, and she's got a fuck trophy, which means she's probably going to get some, like, Bezos money. In fact, pretty sure she's going to be the first woman to pay for a guy to go into space now. I mean, what's there to say on it, really? Elon, he's a nerd. He didn't really understand sexual dynamics. Think about his ex-girlfriends, too. Like, what is, what's his dating history? Amber Heard? Wasn't she the chick that used to beat up uh, Johnny Depp? He's dating her. Thought it was a good idea. Dumped her. Got back together with her. Dumped her. Got together with Grimy, who... And I'm not going to lie to you. My initial idea when I look at her is... Uh, she looks like somebody's anime waifu wet dream. Like, if you were a Redditor and you wanted a girlfriend, that looks like the kind of girlfriend you'd want. Like, what are her aesthetic choices? A cross between suicide girls and anime. But here's the thing. You don't know what he did. You don't know what she did. You're never going to know. You're not going to know... Maybe this has been a completely dead relationship. Maybe it was just for the, uh, maybe it was just transactional. God knows how many, how many, uh, gay politician and actors have gotten a wife just to keep up appearances. Apparently they're called beards, by the way, when a girl just wants to have the social status of being married and the gay guy wants to not get beat up for it. She becomes, he becomes her beard. Uh, he looked really silly when he smoked weed on Joe Rogan just to show off to her. Is that why he did it? But I'll put it this way, like, and this is why, and I don't think I'm ever going to agree to Rich with Rich on this, where that follow your mission, uh, chase excellence, shit like that. I'm like, well, I mean, how many more examples do you need? Bill Gates chased excellence. Uh, Be Bezos chased excellence. Grimy boy there, uh, Elon Musk chased excellence, and they found excellence. Put a man on the moon. He put like, didn't he put like a Tesla on the moon just because he could? I'm going to send this car into space. Maybe that was a flex on his wife. Keep this up and you're fucking next. <laughs> She's like, that's it, I'm out of here. So yeah, it's great. Follow your mission. But I don't think that that's tangential to any kind of like interpersonal relationships. It just is. There's couples of, there's two crackheads out there that are just madly in love. Because the guy's got frame as much as you can for a crackhead. And whatever, whatever skills you need to become a billionaire and to sell PayPal and to go into space and do all this shit and go on Saturday Night Live and actually be funny. Whatever those skills are, those aren't skills that you need to harbor a relationship. If business, if business was a relationship skill, making money would be exactly the same as keeping a relationship on the straight and narrow. Oh yeah, Bill Gates, he had an affair. I mean, whatever. Do you remember? Oh, actually, yeah, why remember, please? Do you remember this? The old Ultimate CAD stuff. He had a great post. I'll never find this one. It's gone in the, in the annals of time. Uh, if she cheats, you'll never know. Fucking wonderful. He was telling a story. So if you guys don't know his story, he, fat schlub, beta male kind of stuff, you know. Um, his wife ended up going on a couple, you know, dates with an old college friend or something like that. Lied about it to him. And then he kind of just like fucking snapped. Maybe she didn't cheat. Maybe she did. But for him, he's like, that's enough. The fact that she's hiding, even meeting up with this guy to me means she probably was. So he had to make some hard choices. The first one being, well, we have a kid. What do I do? Do I just leave her? Let his ego make the decisions? He's like, well, I'm going to leave her, but I'm doing it on my own time. My own schedule. And that's going to emotionally fly off the handle. Pretty frame-like thing to do. I'll give him that. Got himself into shape. Made himself into the most fuckable guy he could. And then fucked everything. Every girl he could. He would constantly get field reports. And it was funny because then he used to argue with, if you guys remember, that girl Kate, Deads and Sushi. He used to fight all the time about this. Yeah, you're just fucking all the frumpy soccer moms in the neighborhood. He's like, ah, fuck off. I'll do what I want. And you're just making this stuff up. And it actually had a good point on this. And this is the one thing I kind of like about the anonymity of the red-pilled space. Is that, um, he goes, look, I can't brag about this shit to friends. I can't brag about it to family or at work. Literally, you anonymous assholes are the only people I can tell this shit to. Because I'm kind of, I'm fucking proud of my accomplishments. I'm racking up notches. And, it, and it the weird thing was that his wife has the right amount of uh, neurotic that it stabilized their relationship. 
It's fucking weird. I guess it's truly one of the best examples of women would rather share a high-value man than be saddled with a lowly loser. But his, his post was, he was in a cab, taking a girl back to wherever to go smash. She tells him to be quiet, calls the house. Hey, hun, how's the kids? Talking all like great mommy stuff. Love you. Mm -hmm. Hangs up the phone, blows him in the cab. I'm like, well, for fuck's sakes. And I believe it. Of course I believe it. If you don't believe me that I believe it, my head's over, my heels over head for Rose. Chapter two of my book. It's my own example of that. Probably the best one I could think of. There's more. But that's the one that stuck out to me because that was the first time. And yeah, as far as you can tell, you'll never know. So that kind of changes. Like all these guys doing all these mate guarding behaviors. What was it? Chasing excellence. Make a billion dollars. Bruno. If your girl, George Bruno, he had a great one where it was, um, if your girl makes more money than you, you better start hiding cash away because she's going to lose love for you. And all this dumb shit. It's like, dude. If she does decide to step out, you're never going to know. So just act as if it could happen at any time. Well, that's not very good. Well, it's like, and it's the funny thing is that if you start acting that way, whether you're not going to change your behavior just because of her behavior change. Again, it's a frame thing, right? I'm going to act the way I'm going to act. You're going to cheat on me or you're not going to cheat on me. And if you do, I probably won't catch you. Not the first time, maybe not even the second time, but eventually everybody slips up. How do you act in that situation? I'll posit this. If you're that guy chasing excellence, chasing your fortune, making that billion dollars because you think that'll keep your wife loyal, and then she ends up doing this stuff, well, your whole worldview just kind of crumbled. It's not going to work anymore. But if you would act as if that soul-crushing event could happen at any time, well, what else can you do? Well, you just act in your own best interests. Fun fact, these situations will come up. You get cheated on, well... I got the plan. Move forward with it. Stay plan is the same as the go plan. But that's not the funny part. The funny part, and this is the part that fucking I love about the red pill. The funny part is the guys who already act like that end up acting attractive enough that it's less likely they even have to be tested. Again, it's one thing from Wisdom of Psychopaths. Yeah. Oh, thank you, one more, please. It's like the my post on the relationship is the woman's job is the cornerstone in MRP. It absolutely is. How funny is that, too? Took that from... Started off as a stupid MGTOW post about Brifalt's Law. It turns out they're actually... They were more right than they thought. But yeah, so you start acting in your own best interest. Always in your own best interest. And you always put the onus on the other people to show that they're valuable to you. And that your excessive happiness overflows. It's like filling a glass of water. Fill it up. Whatever's left flows out to everybody else. Which is funny, because that's like a Peterson quote about the, the rabbit. Remember the rabbit quote? Rabbits are helpless. Their virtue doesn't matter. Well, what the fuck do you think he's talking about? Lions and tigers? He's like, no, man. He's talking about you are a selfish prick. You get all the shit done. You make your life as good as you can. And your life is so good that everybody around you is just fucking showered with manna from heaven. Do you think anybody's going to, I mean, they may, no guarantees in life, but as a general principle, do you think somebody's going to get off of that moving train? Probably not. Dude, this guy's life is so awesome that just by being around him, my life is awesome. Yeah, I'm going to go sleep with a fucking neighbor. Like, no, it doesn't really happen. And it's, okay, so we're going to, I'm going to quickly switch here because, oh no, it's actually it's a good time. Elon must talk. Elon must talk and frame. Fuck it. Uh... Two posts. One was actually from a Patreon a while back. I won't say who or what. Another one was an old, old one about a guy trying to understand frame. And I love it because there's this moment where a guy clicks. Yeah, as a girl, why should I want to stick around? Yeah. One replace is just talking about it. Hey, what are, what are the incentives? Focus on those. So picture this. Guy is doing his self-improvement, dancing monkey plan, trying to be in shape, do all the self-improvement stuff. The wife doesn't respond. The wife doesn't respond. He starts fixing things around the house. He starts doing more chores. He starts taking care of the life. And then at one point he sits there. This is kind of an amalgamation of two stories, by the way. Just sits there. And he looks over. His wife's sitting there, eating bonbons on the couch, wearing jogging pants, getting just fatter in front of him. You can hear her getting fatter. House is clean. Kids are taken care of. They're put into bed. He did all of it. Went to work, came back, did this stuff. She's a stay-at-home. He's just sitting there. And he just sits there. And he realizes he's been doing all this stuff to win her back. Because she's been sexually depriving him for God knows how long. He goes, what the fuck am I putting up with this for? 
and I don't know how to bottle that up. That is a lightning in a bottle situation. And it's not, and then no offense to you, JJ, it's not have an exit strategy. It's not a uh, plan for the worst. It's not a risk management. It's not assuming things are temporary. It's when a guy sits there and he, and the wife goggles are slapped off his face. If you guys don't know, that's a, that's a concept. Wife goggles is how we have an aspirational love. I'm sure you guys know this from the first year Rolo stuff. When you're dating a girl, whatever date, whatever time it is that you fall in love with her, that's her age. If you dated a girl the first time you slept together you, she was 19 she could be 45 and to you she still looks like that 19 year old girl that you, sl that you slept with back in the day it's called wife goggles if it wasn't for that though chicks would never stay married problem is shitty behavior for a long enough time infidelity hard traumatic events will slap that shit off your face and then that aspirational image is gone gone forever and a lot of guys need to lose that because the girl basically has lost like, she doesn't earn it anymore. And so you kind of need to get a realistic look. Like, that's not the same girl that you got together with, man. And yeah, he sat there and he's like, what the fuck is she here for? Just kind of snapped. He didn't get mad. Didn't get fucking vindictive. Didn't start yelling at her. Just, what the fuck are you here for? And then it's like he really started to think about it. And this is like that frame moment that I love it when a guy hits it. I get fucking giddy. Eee. And you see him there and you realize like, he gets it now. And he starts acting differently. When you look at somebody, it's like, what value do you offer in my life? And you don't have an answer? You start acting different. You start treating them different. You start treating them, you know, politely, kindly, like you would a stranger. You don't give them extra stuff. Cuddles ain't free. Get your own glass of water. Your feet aren't broken. You just stop becoming amenable to it. You stop rewarding bad behavior. And people are very perceptive. When all of a sudden behavior changes, and this is where you'll get a lot of things like, hey, why are you mad? Are you getting angry? We need to talk about the relationship and... It's like, oh, I don't think we do. Like, I'm fine. Nothing wrong. It's kind of resigned. But it was funny. And this is, and it came from the, the, have the frame, own the frame you have instead of trying to pretend you have the frame you want. It's absolutely wonderful. Second story, the one I was thinking of, was the same thing. And at one point, the guy and the girl are having brunch or some shit like that. Some fucking $10 eggs and avocado toast and... She was kind of, and the girl was just kind of waxing about, yeah, what do you think about the future? Like, what do you see us doing in the next five years? And the guy looks over, he's like, I just don't see us together in five years. The kids are going to graduate. They're going to move out probably a year from now. I don't think I'm going to be with you anymore. It's just not working for me. But he wasn't angry about it. He was just resigned. He actually came to the married red pill and he was talking about it kind of like, like, what do I do, man? That was like a, that's like a horrible thing. I don't understand. And he was like very confused and he was hurt. And he's like, I fucked up something. To which point we're all like, no, man, that was like probably the first example of frame you had. You understand reality for what it is. You understand your place in it. And you pretty much had a mission, a vision. In his case, his vision was just, I'm just the jaded cop waiting till the kids turn 18 and I'll go get my pension. Thank you. And there's no emotion behind it. I think that's a fucking brilliant thing. And I wish I could spread that. I don't know how, though. Other than just, just keep sticking with it. Like I said, I really do enjoy the Patreon because watching those guys. Dude, some of the work those guys have been doing is like awe-inspiring. And it's not just that. We're actually at the point now. We've been around long enough that... So the first group of guys, there was one particularly going through a very nasty divorce. Well, a, a divorce. It didn't get nasty at first, but eventually we prepared him for it. So by the time it got nasty, he was well done. Then we had a second group of guys talking about, yeah, I don't know. Do I want a divorce or not? I'm like, all right, go back. Look at this guy's stuff. See what happened. Get ready for that. Holy shit. Thank God. You just saved me so much pain. And now we're at the third set of guys. And now the first and second set of guys are like, yeah, man, here's what you need to do. It's like literally a guy swapping notes thing, which is wonderful. And they're all helping each other out. And everybody's making successful decisions. And they're solving problems. A lot of guys aren't. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't... You don't automatically share three real reports, read a Rolo article, and then become master of the fucking universe. A lot of guys are still making very stupid fundamental mistakes, but that's fine. The one thing that's nice about the Patreon is because there's a paywall, they're showing a certain level of investment. So you can skip the whole men with no frame things they do stuff, which is nice. By the time the guy's paying for just a cup of coffee, it's like a Frappuccino a month. You guys can afford it. I mean, how much do you want your life to be happy? It's worth a Frappuccino once a month. Uh, surely many men don't want to lose half their assets via divorce. 
Fun thing, JJ. Actually, yeah, Weimar, please. Great example there. How much is your self-respect worth? That's a great example, too. But I will say this. For all the guys I've seen that are either wanting to or are going through a divorce, money, assets, the house, the car, I've never seen that come up as a concern. Nobody has ever once mentioned, well, dude, I can't afford that. Or, dude, I don't want to live like this. They don't give a shit about lifestyle changes. What I will say is the two things that guys going through divorce seem to concern themselves about with is one, access to their children, which that's probably the big one. And the second one is this nebulous fear and they don't know what it is. It's just a general aversion. They can't articulate it. And it turns out that's the same. And I talk about this in so many goddamn podcasts where it was um the feminization of boys in the developmental phase, failed parenting strategies, sum it up quickly here it's mom divorces dad because whatever she's strong and independent whatever the reasons raises a kid during his first five years when he's at his most weak most developmental she uses what's called a like identity-based uh parenting strategy that's you know don't be a bad boy mom won't love you if you do this and it taps into like your innate fear of abandonment as a child and so you want to act right and please her because she's the most important person in your life and that by being abandoned you're essentially a dead man Naturally, what you're supposed to have is also a father, which offers a structured set of rules. As long as you behave and do these rules, you'll be fine. I got you. Then the kids know, okay, there's a stable rule set, as opposed to make mom happy or else. Now, a guy has that in his mental model, in his brain. It's all limbic brain because you're five. You don't have a fucking frontal lobe. But you go to school. All the, ki all the kids are now, all the teachers are, are women. And they do the same thing. Classes are overloaded. Well, don't be a bad boy. And they essentially reinforce that whole make me happy or you will be excised from the tribe kind of thing, right? Go to the principal's office. And I know it sounds weird, but yeah, all you're doing is you're reinforcing a certain mindset, a certain mental model. Some guys get all the way to the age of like 20, like at a college, not seeing a single male figure of authority in their lives. And then you wonder, how did men get raised as defective women? Well, that's how. That's how. So when you see this stuff, keep that in mind, right? There's a lot of guys that go this way. And I'm not even saying maybe you've had some in your life. Like I've had some, sure. But there's always like an element of it that kind of creeps into your life. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, daughter. Step one, say stop. Step two, punch him in the face. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, so when you get this, like, I just, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't want to, I don't want to, and they and they can't say anything, but that's essentially what it is, because you see it. You'll ask questions. What was your home life like? What was your raised like? Who was the first male authority figure you know? And you always get the same general answer. It's, and then guys realize it's okay, so it's just some, like, instinctive drive that hasn't been bred out of me. And I will say this too, Rib. So, and this is not a totally accurate statement where you're talking about the courts are framed against men. The courts are neutral. And this is something that a lot of guys don't understand. This is one of the reasons I always shit on trads. They don't hate men. But, oh, I hope you got it from me, Jack, because I remember the quote. It's Operation Scorched Earth. It's not against you. It's neutral. But the choices that men make almost guarantee that it's against you. Here's another red pill for you. Uh, Future MD, thank you for the $10 super chat. Paying taxes while I nurse this hangover. Cheers. Keep dunking on the whammon and red pill coffee. <laughs> also, what is the next sidebar? Uh, next sidebar is a cro It's either going to be 48 laws of power, or I'm going to nail a bunch of the like individual posts. I've been kind of, I've been kind of like not wanting to do it because Rolo does his own shit. But there's a lot of first year Rolo stuff that should kind of go in there too. But I don't like the idea of just going over Rolo stuff because he's got God knows like fucking 500 hours of live streams where he goes over it too. And I'm like, do you guys really want more of the same? But then I think about, there's like 100 million guys watching Jordan Peterson videos that have 500 million views. And I'm like, maybe you will watch it five fucking times. So maybe I should. So we'll see. Uh, heads up, Troy and I are going to do 48 soon. 48 what? Oh, Laws of Power? Yeah, give her. Like I said, there's 48 Laws of Power shit everywhere. I'm sure another one. Oh, Yeah. That's the other thing. So I never considered it. Is the DOD stuff considered sidebar? If you guys don't know, 60 Ds of Dread is uh, it's like a themed thing every year. 
where you go over all the general, like the general parts of self-improvement and like how you can work on it. There's actually a lot in there too. I never thought about that as sidebar, but that's probably pretty important. Oh no, there's not going to be any collabs on the, and YUD, there's not going to be any collabs on the sidebar. The sidebar is strictly like everybody says, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? I'm like, the sidebar is there. It's, it's a thing. It exists. I'm not going to start elaborating on it. I'm just taking that and delivering it visually and audibly. And fun fact though, JJ, 48 Laws of Power actually makes the least sense. Out of all the sidebar material, it's probably the least, I would say it's second least important next to the Jack, uh, I think it's Jack Donovan's Way of Men because that fucking hippie power of positivity shit doesn't really help anybody. But like I said, it's a matter of getting it down there. Do Roy who Rolo's first year with Rolo? Well, no, I'm solo. This is, this is, to be fair, the sidebar shit is my shit. Or, I mean, it's not my shit, but I'm not doing it. No gimmicks, no collabs, no whaminate shit, no fucking hullabaloo. It's, it's, I want it to be C-SPAN level of interesting. And I don't mean that as a pejorative. I want it to look as boring as C-SPAN. Fuck that. Um, anyways, back to the topic here. What are we on for time? Oh, we actually only got 20 minutes left. Although I'm probably going to end it in the next 10 here. I actually like having those extra 10 minutes to go have breakfast before we do uh, do that. So anyways, to sum this all up again, understand be less attractive is important. And the thing that Scientologists got right, the thing that Scientologists got right about psychology is that it is not beneficial for you. You may understand their rigor is great. Their studies are good. The pills are useful. They're very important. They have a lot of authority. The APA is a, has a blue check on Twitter, whatever. But if it's not helping you, then what the fuck good is it? It shouldn't matter to you. As far as you're concerned, it's absolutely useless. Again, anything outside your frame. Amusing, intriguing, or funny. In this case, I'd say intriguing because I'll take some of the studies and see if there's things we can apply. Sure, but there's a lot of stuff you can't. Um, you're on your own. Nobody's going to help you. Nobody has your best interest at heart, even me. Another red pill quote, and I can't remember who this one. I want to, I always say everything that sounds like this, like scolding father is either wine more please or whisper. So it could be either one, but it was, uh, I'm not telling you this shit because I like you. I will still steal your girl and eat your sandwich. I'm just not spouting bullshit because I don't like bullshit, not because I like you. And that's kind of how you have to have, uh, so this isn't going to be some parasocial thing where it's just demagogue and sycophant. You're not going that route. If you want to go the, no offense to him, the Tate route, I'm awesome. And you guys like being attached to a winner. Go for it. Fill your boots. Not why I'm here. I don't really care if you guys like me. I just care if you're here to learn, learn and pay my bills while you learn. Good enough. But yeah, hate your hate your hate your guru just a little bit same way i say hate your audience just a little bit if i like you guys too much you're going to start driving the content and then it's not doing you any good it's just reinforcing what you already know and at that point i'm just a dancing monkey for quarters it's not doing anybody any favors and if you guys like me too much well then you become just like a fucking army that i get sick on other people which is great i'll get paid i'll take it but it's really not helping you because then you aren't learning the material all you've done is replaced jesus or your dad with Jesus, Jesus with Jordan Peterson, and then Jordan Peterson with me. Also not too helpful. What the fuck's the point? You hold them accountable. Fucking hell. Don't listen like a spurk. When you're hearing, and this is not just a red pill thing, this is an everything. There is the process, and there is the content. There is the words being used, and there's the subtext, the words not being used. There's the context of why things are being said. There's the motivations of the speaker. And you have to take this all into account. In fact, if anything, you could ignore the content. Ignore the words somebody's actually using. And focus on the intent behind it. And that's the, one of the best ways to A, avoid getting manipulated. B, to learn something in a conversation. Or C, understand why you aren't learning something from it. Ryan as a cult leader would be too legit. Dude, I would be the worst fucking cult leader ever. I wouldn't sleep. First off, there's no chicks. If you're running a cult, you need to have a bunch of chicks in here, and they all need to be a harem. Secondly, 
none of you guys would drink Kool-Aid because you don't like sugar. <laughs> yeah, but you can dance five hours to 30 minutes. Yeah, what can I say? I mean, I'm, I may not be the busiest man on earth, but I am the most impatient man on earth. So if I can make it shorter. He couldn't put Patreon on time. I don't think he can manage. Dante, I'm gonna fucking ban you from the channel for that shit. I'm talking shit. <laughs> All right. So Dante was fucking hilarious a minute ago, so he can be hilarious 300 seconds from now. <laughs> Uh, no, no hating on him. He'll be back. Don't worry about it. It's just 300 seconds. Um, hey, Ryan, how do you find motivation to put all the learnings into action? I don't find motivation. Motivation is a chick emotion. Motivation is fleeting. Motivation is fickle. Motivation doesn't do shit. It's just called discipline. Here's the thing. Let me ask you this, Drexler. How do you find the motivation to do things in your own best interest? Like, you see how silly a question that is? It's like, how about I do things in my own best interest because I want to succeed? And if I do something, there's a reason. Do you think I want to get up at 9 in the morning? I felt like shit last night. Wake up at 9 in the morning. I wanted to have a beer, although I'm on a cut, so I can't, but at least wanted to look at it. I would love to sleep until 10. We had a great breakfast plan. My girl was rushing at the end of the day to finish the eggs so I could have breakfast, and I had to scarf it down in five minutes. I'd love to sit down and have a 20-minute date watch some fucking hermit craft and enjoy the morning. But no, come in here. Not, not motivated to, but there's a plan. Red Morning is the podcast. We've been doing it for two years without fail. I think I've missed like one Saturday in the last two years of this show. And I always make an effort to give you guys an hour and a half to two hours of actionable content. And then right after this, go straight over to Rule Zero. It's not because I'm motivated to do Rule Zero. It's because I'm disciplined. We do Rule Zero. We do our Harlem Globetrotters versus the Washington Capitals. I do this one. This one is trying to be as actionable as possible. It's trying to engage with you guys as much as possible. It's trying to make sure that anything I know, anything I have learned, and anything I have seen other people learn, get that to you guys in as more in a in as best articulated way as possible. And then you guys pay from your time, your attention. We build some subscribers from it. We build a channel. We build an audience. You guys know the game, right? And there's costs. And that's the thing. Like, if I was motivated, let's say Super Chats. Let's say Super Chats are how I stay motivated. Well, I didn't get many Super Chats now. Maybe I just don't want to do it anymore. Just do like a petulant child thing. Well, I'm done. If you guys don't appreciate me, I'm fucking out of here. Podcast over. But that's how you get like the fucking fresh and fit yelling at Wham and White Claw at Power Hour. I think because Rolo and them were showing me that thing where you can see like what channels get more Super Chats. I guess the Myron guys get like $100,000 I don't know, a month on Super Chats or something like that? Absolutely insane. Like, what the fuck, man? I could just yell at drunk chicks for $100,000? Dude, do you know how much work I used to have to do for $100,000? I used to have to go deploy to the Middle East and find Somali pirates for hundred grand. Meanwhile, you guys are just sitting here shitting on women in Miami. Fuck, I'll do that for free. <laughs> um, Yeah, so like I said on the, on the, the Make Your Fortune thing, like, there's costs with it. But that's the thing. It's a deliberate choice. I know what the purpose of this is. I know what the intended audience is that I want to be. I don't want to pander to an audience. I don't want an audience to pander to me. And so it's going to have less growth than a mainstream audience is going to have. It's going to have less income than a mainstream audience would have. So what do I do around that? And this is where the motivation answer comes in. So I know that it's going to do less well than if I just yell at chicks. Fine. Monetary cost. Let's say... Let's say I lose out on, I'm just picking random numbers here. Let's say it's the difference between $2,000 and $4,000 a month. So if I'm losing $2,000 by not going that route, then how do I make up the difference? Will I either learn to live $2,000 beneath my means or learn to make $2,000 elsewhere? And in my case, you know, I'll write a book. Yeah, I'll start a second channel with Minecraft. Make ways to supplement that. And this is why, and you're asking, how do you stay motivated? It's discipline. At this point, I don't even have to think about it. My feelings are outside of the equation. Now it's just a matter of you're showing up to work every day. You're doing your job. You have a plan. You're following through. You know what's working well because you've made the effort and I've covered it. So no matter what happens, I'm okay. 
Does that make sense? Does that answer it? And, I, and it's kind of like a meta thing. You may, you may or may not have noticed, but throughout the history of this channel, my Twitter account, my, uh, the book, all the stuff, there's always a meta example. Case in point, the uh, the Danny California or the uh, the uh, the Gwen episode. Guys are getting seriously pissed off at those. Again, it's things guys without frame and things they do. What the fuck, man? We're supposed to be talking about guys. Why are you letting the women into the locker room? I'm like, all right. We've talked 500 times about money muscles game. You guys sitting here saying how game is important, how fucking social skills are great. You guys have paid a million dollars to John just to learn about body language. Everybody loves to talk about, oh yeah, I could totally fucking game a girl. So I'll bring a girl onto a podcast for two hours to show you how to have a conversation, how to escalate, how to gauge and read body language. It was literally an example for you guys to look from. How to show, like, everybody's like, well, what if somebody's boring? How do I feign interest? Well, I'm like, well, I'll show you how not to feign interest. Actually take an interest in what they're talking about. Again, pearls before swine. You guys are switched on, but there was a lot of guys who really didn't get it. And I'm like, well, the trick to good storytelling is to show, don't tell. And, like, how bad would it be if I'm talking to you about how much of a an alpha male the Rule Zero guys are? Meanwhile, you put one girl in there, we just start fucking yelling at them. Which, and to be fair, I haven't watched, like, the Fresh and Fit ones where Rolo or Aaron and them came on, so... Or Paul, I think. I think Paul was on it, too. I haven't watched any of those. So, for all, I'm hoping... I'm hoping they gave an example of being, like, a charming and how a red pill guy can make you a generally more attractive person. Because otherwise, it makes it sound like I'm shitting all over them, which I'm not. But yeah, if I'm just going to go on there and lecture girls about how your egg cartons and your accountability and keep your dime between your knees like your mother told you, I'm not teaching you guys anything. I'm just helping you guys be insolent. It's no different than Jerry Springer beating up some KKK to make you guys feel good or showing Maury Povich who is or isn't the father. I just think you guys deserve a better classic guru. It's too bad. I just wish I was something special because then it would be easy. As opposed to everybody else who's a Superman. I'm like, I'm just an average guy, man. Literally down the line. Average for everything. If I can do it, you can do it. Uh, thank you, Anon, by the way. You're the only one I trust. I wouldn't go trusting me. Let me earn the trust. Don't just give it to me. But even if you go buy your Lambo, I'll still respect and be grateful to you. The one thing I can guarantee you is I won't buy a Lambo. I don't, I don't, I don't particularly like cars to begin with. I've never been a car guy. Um, the one thing I would buy if I had, there is a, a Chevelle. It's not a Chevelle, but it's, um, they have like a bunch of variations of it. There was this one small roadster version of it that I remember seeing as a kid at a police auction, which we went to all the time. And I wouldn't mind one of those, but I wouldn't like restore it classically. I'd fill it with all kinds of fucking, all the shit that pisses off classic car guys, you know, like a CD player on the inside kind of shit or a Bluetooth speakers and under lights and shit like that. I don't know. That would probably be why I get it, but I'd never drive it. It'd probably be just nice to have it. I think it's better as one of those things that I want to have as opposed to actually having. But yeah, how many could hold an engaged conversation with a girl for an extended period of time? That's the question you got to ask yourselves, man. Again, you guys all joke around. A lot of guys think pickup is just for losers and shit like that. But I'll say this. The framework of it makes it very easy to do now. Yeah. So think about that when you're shitting on mystery. You can do it without, sure, but, you know, why would you have to? It's funny and seems ironic, but the guy who least postures morality is the one most sincere. Dude, I've been saying that since the fucking start. Dude, nothing bothers me more. You want to actually see me irritated, Dr. Smith? Well, here it is. All those fucking assholes talking about uh, authenticity. I'm like, fuck your authenticity. Try some sincerity. You know what authentic is? Authentic? Tom Cruise plays an authentic spy in Mission Impossible. Uh, fucking Val Kilmer plays an authentic Batman in that one Batman movie. Anthony Johnson plays an authentic Lamborghini owner in his stupid 21 convention thing. Authenticity is something... You can even look it up. Here, let's pull it up. Dictionary definition. This is what's going to blow your mind. Uh, where is it? Oh, for crying out loud. Authenticity. Uh, the adjective authentic describes something that is real or genuine and not counterfeit. Be careful when you are buying jewelry or watches. So all it's saying is something that doesn't look fake. Here's the problem. 
I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I'm, I'm an alpha male. I don't think the term exists, but are you an alpha male? Probably not. Most people aren't. And if you are, you're not watching a podcast at nine in the morning while you're doing your gym time. How are you going to know what an authentic thing looks like? You're going to look like what appeals to authenticity. You're going to look like if you're a broke guy, I bet you the most expensive car from the highest roller is a fucking Cadillac with spinners on it. Do you think billionaires are driving cars with spinners? Do you think they're even driving? That's authenticity. Authenticity is spinners. Spinners. Sincerity is just, yeah, how about I just don't lie to you because I don't like bullshitting. Authenticity has been reduced to marketing jargon. Everything's reduced to marketing jargon. That's why and That's why I actually don't mind. Everybody's like, oh, every red pill concept has been stolen by marketers now. I'm like, yeah, let them keep. Just keep advancing, man. I fucking dare them to keep up. You ain't shit, but that's okay. How do you think marketers are going to steal that one? Uh, they haven't stolen it yet. And when they do, I'll move on. Anyways, uh, end of the episode. Hope you guys enjoyed yourself. I'm an authentic douche. I mean, I'm not a douche. You just are what you are. That's the thing. When you tell guys, like, be an a like be a lovable asshole. Like, what's an asshole? An asshole is what another person thinks is an asshole. An asshole is my way of saying you're hurting my ego. But enjoy yourselves. Catch you guys in the next one. Thank you for all the super chats. Thank you, Wine More, please. Any time of yours we can carve out, so much the better. Uh, I'll get to I'll get to more sidebar stuff here. Uh, the second book is getting closer to finished. We're about 30,000 words into the second draft right now. It looks like it'll be at about 100. And then I get to start the editing process. And hopefully I get it far enough along that we can uh, that we can get back to sidebar series shit. But uh, as always, you know how to support the channel. Oh, and I probably should put this here. So, tube.com, digital glass. If you didn't know, I have a second channel. I took all of this bravado-laden alpha male shit, and I'm like, you know what? I hate sitting here 1984 style, and yes, I'm doing that now, just preaching into the camera about shit you should do. So I thought, let's tone it down. Let's just relax. It's a gaming channel. Fucking playing Minecraft. Whatever. Graveyard Keeper. Chilling out with the boys. The T-Rex army. Let's have some fun with this. Let's not take it so seriously. So come in and check it out. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's a format just like this, but it's mostly driven by you guys because a lot of you guys always have like, hey, you should do this. You should do that. Well, if you want us to do that, this is where you do it. Right in there. 10 till 12, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Come on in. Check it out. Have some fun. Uh, that's where the merch is going to be. I'm eventually going to do some of that there because you know, we'll have some fun. Show some support. Give some love. Started up a Minecraft SMP. I think we're going to have some fun with that one. I think that's starting up next week. So it should be fun. Come on in, subscribe. Come on, check it out. I'll talk to you guys later. Enjoy the rest of your day. And don't forget Paul's channel, Rule Zero. I'll see you there.